Okay, so um, if you have any questions. Do you have a high turnover of employees? Uh, no, we don't. Um, we're 230 odd people. Um, I think particularly compared to our industry, we don't. The, um, we do have uh, people we, bring, we take on on uh, fixed term contracts. So some of our, the work we do is, uh, I wouldn't say seasonal so much, but when we have a big game coming out, we take on people for three months to the testing phase. Uh, so if you discount that, I think our, our turnover is quite low. Do you know the figure offhand, Neil? Uh, 11.9 is our underlying turnover. Okay, right. So I, I, I think you know, that's reasonably okay in our business. It's quite low compared to others, but obviously I'd like it to be low. I think with any industry, that you know, I actually see competition as being quite good in the sense that um, people play games. If you're a gamer, in the same way if you watch films, you, you need to have films for you to be able to have that as a hobby, and we can't um, completely <laughs> satisfy that. So looking at, um, there are different types of competitor. The, uh, what I would say is the old publishers are still, to an extent, competitors to us. So there are companies that you've probably heard of, people like Activision, Electronic Arts. Uh, they sell games primarily for console on disc through retail. But they are, particularly EA, have woken up to the fact that online is a really big deal. Uh, so Electronic Arts, um, very, very big company. Uh, but if you look at the, the new world, so app stores and online um, stores, their games are alongside ours. They're not given any prominence at all. Uh, and that's mainly because, um, you know, the, from a user, a player point of view, we're just considered essentially alternatives. You know, oh, shall I play FIFA or shall I play Lost Winds? And what is great is, is essentially these things um, are essentially a meritocracy. So um, on Apple's App Store, things are sorted by success. And, you know, so our games are up there with theirs. And... Uh, so the huge investment they've got in uh, bricks and mortar infrastructure in terms of offices throughout the US doesn't help them. You know, it, when you talk about territories, one of the things that uh, Frontier, um, in fact, has been very, very pleasant. We, we sell a lot of games in China, and uh, there's certainly China is our top three territory, and at times it's our top territory. That's bigger than the US. Um, and we couldn't have done that 10 years ago. And the reason we do that is we can do that is because of online. You know, the, the, the Chinese government is, seems to be very, very happy with that. Um, selling through online stores is, is very, very attractive to us. And the, the rate China is going, the rate China is moving to high tech is, is very, very, very interesting to watch. And the point is, EA is just as well known as we are out there. Um, and it depends on what their games are. You know, and I think EA is a very Western company. Whereas we're still, we're still small, relatively speaking, and quite lithe. Uh, historically, most of um, games by Activision and EA uh, and other big publishers have been made by third parties. And when I say we're moving from our, a sort of essentially a cost plus business model, um, we have been doing a lot of the games for these big, big publishers, particularly Microsoft in our case. Uh, EA relies on third party developers like us. And when I say the power is moving to the content creators, that's exactly what I mean. People don't necessarily have to go through EA anymore. They can go directly to the customer. And that is essentially what we're talking about. And, and take a bigger slice of that pie without taking on any more a huge amount of extra risk in the sense that um, one of the big problems with selling uh, discs on console is they, they have a long lead time. And so they all have to be manufactured at day one. That's a huge inventory risk if a game is un unsuccessful or needs to be modified. Whereas when you're selling online, it, it, the modifications are transparent and there's no concept of stock, which is fantastic. Is Thanks. pirating an issue to be concerned about? Yes. Piracy has been there since I've been writing games, to be honest. Uh, it's an issue to think about. So we've done a lot of stats. One of the great things with our games over the last sort of three or four years is uh, they are what we call in instrumented. So we know when they're installed, we know where they're installed, and we know who they're installed by. Um, and what's very interesting, particularly in China, is there is a lot of piracy. 
and we can track because when what we found is people generally don't pirate our game, they pirate the device. So the equivalent of jailbreaking an iPad or whatever means that it doesn't connect to the Apple store, it connects directly to some dodgy store. Uh, however, the game hasn't changed, so our instrumentation is still in there, which is very, very interesting. So for some kinds of games, actually piracy isn't a bad thing, it's a distribution method where in-app purchases can still work, even though the game hasn't been, uh, been derived from the, st the standard route. Um, I don't want to be blase about it because piracy is an issue. It's been historically a very big issue um, on silver disk duplication. Um, one of the games, in fact, Frontier, a game I mentioned, was sold throughout Europe and we tracked all the figures. And I did a correlation of the number of technical support queries with the numbers sold in each territory. And uh, Italy, we had the same number of technical support queries as roughly as uh, France. And yet we had sold almost no copies. Um, and, well, it doesn't take a genius to work out. I mean, we, we managed to buy some. The, the copies were very good. They were done in commercial duplicators, but they weren't done by us. You know, and it's that sort of... It's commercial piracy is the big problem. Um, that, with online now, is much less of an issue because most of our games going forward... Um, in fact, the games we're working on now all um, have online functionality. And uh, our servers can just check the ID and choose what to do with that information. For example, not work. You know, or, or mention a message to say, that, or just simply deprive it of some functionality. Because one of the things in our business, uh, actually, is um, d discovery of games. If a game's free, we actually give out free demos anyway for a lot of games. Um, it's historically been a very, very good way to get sales. So actually, piracy isn't always all downside. Um, because, especially for a game with key online services, if the, the, the user doesn't get those and feels they really want them, uh, then that would be a reason to upgrade to a paid copy. My very first game, Elite, that we've been talking about, um, did suffer quite badly from piracy. But we ran a competition um, in the first six months of the game where every month people could, they, they came up with a little uh, postcard, which you'd write in a competition entry number that the game printed out for you, which gave you your progress. And then you, they sent it into Acorn. And uh, we, and in fact, we had a room full to the ceiling of these stacked up. Uh, and then I, got, I talked to the competition entry, they, 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 there was a playoff between all the competition entry winners. Um, a lot of them had actually bought the game in order to enter the competition because they couldn't photocopy the entry card. And it, it just shows that if people are sufficiently motivated, and I, I think there was a bit of guilt that they played it solidly for several months at that point. You know, um, I think piracy, as long as you bear it in mind and don't just bury your head in the sand, can actually be a positive in the end. You know, a lot of the pirates either couldn't afford to buy the game or aren't sure they want to buy the game, so might not have bought it otherwise. But if you get them playing it, they may well evangelise it to their friends and they may well ultimately buy it. You know, so I, I think as long as you sort of, we sort of bear it in mind, um, it's, it's probably not a, a real threat. I see it as potentially an opportunity. Is it becoming harder to contain development costs? Uh, you mentioned some things like Grand Theft Auto, but their budgets were also equally as massive as technology moves on. Is it harder to pick a project where you can contain development costs, bearing in mind the cost of development for Xbox One? Well, um, I would say no. I mean, the, the development costs have gone up, but they've gone up with the full expectation of them going up, if that makes sense. It's not that they have run wild. The budgets have been set to be that. You know, Grand Theft Auto, they set a very, very high budget, uh, and they got big-name actors, for example, playing various roles. You know, there, there are a lot of things like that, that that eat into the budget. They, they had huge teams working on that. If you've played the game, it is amazing how much stuff there is in there. Um, you know, and, and script writers, localization, the fact they've got a fact, actors in every country. Um, I think the size of the budget is separate from the... The budget, um, certainly in games I've been uh, involved with, hasn't run away. We've known exactly what the budget is, and we've stuck to it. You know, the... Um, the we have, in fact, a really, really powerful asset, which is, you know, I mentioned the Zoo Tycoon game was developed in double-quick time. Um, that's because we have mature technology 
that we have a very, very good feel for, for what it can do, how well it can do it. Um, and, and I think that is a very, very good way of, of constraining the budget. So, you know, because it keeps it small, we, it makes us very attractive to work with people like, in that case, Microsoft. Is your general target, what is your general target audience? Is it, is it, I mean, you know, when you talk about games, it would suggest children or you youngsters anyway. Well, no. You do, do have quite a, quite a short attention span, don't you? <laughs> yes. Um, no question, some of our games, like Zoo Tycoon and uh, Disneyland Adventures, are aimed primarily at kids. Uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon had a very, very broad audience. That was one of the first ever games where the number of uh, male and female players was comparable, um, which is seen as a huge success because it's a game where you're building things, you're creating, you're also understanding what the guests of your theme park want. Um, I think the ages of the audience, certainly the ages are growing or have been over the last five years, going up by more than a year per year. So it's not just an audience getting older. You know, the, the, the themes of games have also changed. So there are a lot of games which are, are aiming at, at an older audience. I think the average age of gamers, last time I saw it, was 28, which is only slightly lower than the average age of the population. Um, and, and I think the, the, the point with that is, it, and we're not there yet. We're in the early days of an industry. And I, I think for gamers, sort of our age, if you like, when we see um, discussions of, I don't know, the politics of Napoleonic Parliament, and you're just chatting with characters in the game, the barriers, because one of the things I think, there, there are two problems. One of the things I've noticed amongst MPs is there are actually very few game players amongst MPs. And they have an image that um, games from 10, 20 years ago, which were all very annoying, repetitive, bleepy things, uh, because that's what their kids were playing and they've not had any contact since. Um, whereas there are other uh, MPs, people like Tom Watson and Ed Vasey, who are actually, who are gamers and actually know a lot about games, who have a completely different view of them. Um, I, I think it, it's changing slowly, uh, but I think um, in terms of the audience, it depends on the game. The audience for Elite is actually a very old audience. The audience for World of Tanks is quite an old audience. It's very similar to the audience for Elite. What I mean by old is I mean people in their 30s and 40s is, is, is the sort of the, a common peak, which is, I know, it's younger than most of us, certainly younger than me. I'm 50, by the way. Um, but the, the point is that's actually a lot older than, say, Minecraft, where the average age is probably um, teen or even sub-teen. You know, so it's like saying, what is the age audience for films? You know, Bond films, I would guess it's people in their 20s, but there are a lot of films where that's not the case. You know, we, we're a very diverse industry. We do games that are for niche audiences. World of Tanks is a simulation about Second World War tanks and tank battles. It's a social game, and, you know, it, a lot of people like playing it. Um, I would like to say there is game for just about everybody. That's not entirely true. But I think that will be true in 10, 20 years, where all we are is an interactive entertainment medium. Uh, a film is just equivalent of a game with no interaction, you know, ultimately. And, and I think when people start to see our industry like that, they will realise, and I think many already have, certainly the TV industry is very threatened by the games industry and knows it, which is why there are no games-related programmes on TV. So I hope that answers the question. It certainly tells me why I have in terms of like, doing it. Yeah. Are you not, you're not using India or China for the low, low pay countries for game writing. Is that a policy? Do you see that change in the future to help margins? Well, we are. So, um, where we need to, the, the, the real problem we've had is that it, it's very, very hard engaging uh, creative people effectively in those territories. So, the Disneyland Adventures game I mentioned. Um, we had uh, just more than 100 people at Frontier on it, but in total, at one point, we had 395 people on that game. Um, and that's because we went to a lot of what's called outsource, where we worked in China and India. China, to be honest, was the more successful of the two. Um, and was, we, it's working well with those countries is the challenge, and efficiently. But yes, we have done that, and we continue to do it. Um, it's a relatively small percentage. So the, the, the number of staff we've talked about, that's the full-time people at Frontier. So for projects, we can easily have the same again externally for a period of three months, one month, 
six months. Um, it, it, it's a case of some things are easy to outsource because they're well defined, others are harder. But we do do it. Going forward, how are you going to grow your bottom line? And are the, the games available in 3D or try definition? Yes, so. Um, and uh, last question, where do you see the sh share price in this year's time? <laughs> <laughs> I've got my okay, well, I'll answer the last one. On the buy button right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer the last one first. Um, we, I am not allowed to talk about um, share price and things. Uh, otherwise, very bad things happen, so I'm told, if I do. Uh, and especially as we, we've gone to market without issuing guidance. Um, we are doing some really great games. We have some very, very exciting things in the future. So hopefully those things will influence how things go in the future. But I, 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 I can't comment on the other things. So going... Um, Back to your second question. So we already support high definition. So um, the Zoo Tycoon game we're showing, I think the reason the video was startling is it's 1080p and that computer is having a hard time showing it. It's also ultra high definition as well. Yep. So we, um, we have support. We have things that will run at 1400p. We can support 4K if you've got a brutal enough device to run it on. Uh, currently, the Hmm? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, currently, there are not very many of those in the marketplace, um, but it's very easy for us to add because we have our own technology. Um, other technologies we support, we support 3D TVs. If you've got one, and again, it's the machine cap attached to it is capable. Um, we've also publicly mentioned we support uh, 3D headsets like Oculus Rift, um, which is, is, is interesting. A lot of our alpha backers actually have played on that. I think it's nearly 10%. Um, you know, so uh, with those technologies, we'll adopt them as they become available. And um, I think, you know, we're going through a very interesting time with mobile devices and wearable devices, you know, things that we can support like Oculus Rift. Uh, so to go to your first one, the principal cross question, um, the principal reason to the way we're changing the bottom line is by moving from a cost plus model, which where we would sell a game to someone like Microsoft uh, and then earn out the development costs and hopefully get a royalty. But that tends to be at the 20% level and only once you earn out. A lot of games don't earn out very far or don't earn out at all. You know, so that's a relatively low margin business. Um, the revenue share model is completely different where we get... In the case of PC sales for Elite Dangerous, we get the whole thing less VAT and uh, transaction costs. Uh, when we're going through stores like um, the Apple Store, Microsoft Xbox Live, and things like that, we get 70%. You know, it's a completely different business model. Um, and we, we did a trial in 2008 with a game called Lost Wins. It just means we hit break even way quicker. And you know, that, that's a huge positive. Um, it's transition, you know, we, we're going through, that's why we floated, or one of the reasons we floated, and it's, you know, it's going very well so far. You're seeing the results with the Elite Dangerous game. And how, how accurate are those estimates? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to cut with, sorry, uh, they aren't estimates, I'm just trying to, those are scenarios based on what it can do out there, you know. I, I just got to be very careful. I can't remember what number rule it is, but I'm not allowed to comment on such things under stock market rules. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it, what have you seen as the lifetime of a game now? Okay, so um, I think it's what do you see as the lifetime of a pet would be a good question. So Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 is um, near, coming up to 10 years and is still selling well uh, and will probably continue to sell well. So other games, you look at Grand Theft Auto V, it had, its sales had decreased very rapidly within, I think, two months. But that's not that the lifetime of the game is short. What's happened is pre-owned sales and things like that have really eaten into the sales of the game. And the way the game is designed to be played, it's a story, and once you've played the story, you'll tend not to go back to it. A game like Elite, where there's regular updates, where the world is changing. So Elite is set in a whole galaxy where there are uprisings, there's famine going on all the time, in real time. Um, the life of these online games, look at a game, one of the older ones, something like World of Warcraft. 
you know, that's been going up for sort of eight to ten years, I think. So, you know, it's been going well for a long time. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's decayed because I think they've got to keep it fresh. And what happens a lot is the creative people who start these games um, move on and then the energy goes out of it and then they're no longer successful. We've seen that a little bit with the big franchise I mentioned, Call of Duty, which is just starting to tail off. Um, so I, I think it, it depends on, the, 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 you know, it's long but not forever. I think we've probably got to go one last question, I think. That length of, of, of uh, life, uh, is that predominantly purchased or used a game as it will to, to begin with, upgrading and getting upgrades, etc. But then there's not many new players coming into the game eight years in, are there? Or are no, there are. Um, there, so Rollercoaster Tycoon, I think we've, we are the definitive rollercoaster game at the moment um, and have been for a long time because we set the bar so high. Uh, there, a lot of those people are new players to the game because they're interested in roller coasters. Um, some of them will be people upgrading, but the original game will still work on their PC, so it's very unlikely they would buy it again. Um, so I think it's primarily new players. Um, David, I think, can we take one more question? I think there was one more at the back. Yeah, one more at the back. L last question. Uh, you talked about the, and I get the point about the risk having changed and A, you're moving to a high reward model. And, mm -hmm. um, And historically, um, creative risk was, if you like, an issue because very few developers actually had a track record of developing more than one big game. So if you take the talk about Grand Theft Auto and DMA, I think they did, they're did. almost unique because they did their means yep. before they did GTA. Um, it, is that risk, how do you mitigate that risk? You're still a relatively small company. Yep. Um, and uh, you may have you may have dealt with the risks associated with development along the way. You still got to have that creative kernel. Um, how do you how do you approach that with a relatively small small group of, uh, of people? Obviously, you yourself are historically the, the, the ultimate example of a developer. Um, but how many more Davids are there um, who are actually coming up with new ideas? What does your offer look like? Okay, so um, answer there are, there are two things. Firstly, for, based on track record, we've had a lot of conspicuous successes that are very different to each other. Whether it's Lost Winds, whether it's Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, whether it's Elite, you know, all, all, all very different games. Um, we have a process called Game of the Week, which has, was started when the company, shortly after the company was started, uh, where it no longer, it's no longer a game a week, but people are forever putting up ideas on internal confidential, you know, private forums and tearing them apart. You know, the gamers are the biggest critics of games and say, oh, and that's rubbish, that, oh, that's too much like this game and all this sort of thing. That process has been going on all the time. We've got a, think of it as a war chest of hundreds of game ideas. Those are, we can run our own filters, how well we think it will do on the marketplace, but it, it means people in the company, you can see which game ideas they really buy into. Uh, we announced a few weeks ago that we signed two new contracts with publishers based on two of these games. They're new, uh, exciting new game ideas. I can't talk about them yet. But they came through this process. Lost Winds came through this process. Um, and has won all sorts of awards and was commercially very successful. We've had um, something seven plus million downloads of that game. It's probably eight by now. Oh, it's eight now. But yeah, good. <laughs> you know, it's doing very, very well. Um, and the point is, it's because a company like ours attracts gamers because they want to work in games. And that's a very, very good audience who are full of wacky ideas. Some of them are so bizarre, we probably wouldn't want to do them. But the point is, some, sometimes that idea can get folded into another idea and it becomes much more solid. And because it's a long incubation period, we have a lot of ideas that have, have been incubated pretty well. Uh, we will never make even 10% of those games. But the point is, we're choosing from a big selection, and we're choosing forewarned, if you like. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs>